Question yes. number one. We had uh, a lot of questions that were dropped off in the lobby, so uh, I have the first one here. This one is from three-year-old Vidamor. Do we have Vidamor in the audience? Say it again. <laughs> Il Amor, three years old. Well, she is asking, what is your favorite color, food, and animal? Hers is red, tacos, and dinosaurs. <laughs> My favorite color is red. My favorite food is tacos. <laughs> and I love dinosaurs. Yeah. <laughs> oh. Hi. Oh, Chula. Hey, be careful. Be careful walking down. Oh, come on. <laughs> Can I have a hug? <laughs> Go like this. Throw her a kiss. Throw her a kiss. <laughs> I love you. I love you. It's so cute. That is cute. We have another question. Another right? question. I really admire and look up to you as a role model. What advice would you give to an inspiring actor during these times? And this is from Lizette. Gracias, Edward James. Almost, eres un orgullo. The, the arts are really disciplines. And uh, we already went through the discipline situation. So all I can tell you, if, as far as acting and working and theater and being a storyteller because that's what you're trying to do whether you be the director or the actor or the sound person or wardrobe whatever department you want to be working in you're, you're a storyteller you're helping tell the story now all I can tell you is that the world is opening up it's been so long coming and but it's in slowly opening but you are hitting it at the exact greatest time you could be if I was a young actor right now, I'd be so happy because now they're really looking at us. They're really paying attention to us. They're trying desperately hard to find our story. So if you can write, write. If you can act, act. If you're a singer, sing. Now, right now, our arts are, are really needed because there's so many of us. And what happens is it, it's the only expression that we we can share with the whole, all the human race, and that's the, our, our arts. So I say to all of us, the young artists, young actors, please, don't stop. The only people I know that don't make it are the ones that don't. I mean, they need to stop up there. So if you don't stop, it might take you 50 years, it might take you 40 years, it might take you 20 years. That's not the reason you do, you, that you're doing it. You're doing it because you really appreciate it and want to tell your story. So do it. Tell your story. Yeah. All right, another question. Uh, Mr. Almost, would you mind speaking briefly about the Chicano area or the Chicago area connections and influences in your life and your career? The the influences, what influences? The Chicago area influences. Oh, God, are you kidding? Uh, the fact that uh, when I came here, I, brought, I came here the, the very first time was really back in 1983, I think it was. Uh, the Negrete family, you probably tell me that. Okay. Yeah. But they, they, they remember before. Because I, I literally, I brought with me a film called The Ballad of Gregorio Cortez. Remember okay. that. And I came to Chicago for the first time to show it for free to anybody that wanted to see it. And uh, we had no money. We were doing this all on our own. And uh, Chewy said, hey, come on, man. You can come over to my house. And uh, you can stay there, man. Really? Yeah, man, you don't need no hotel. Come on. So we went over there, and I slept on the floor. <laughs> really nice. <laughs> they had a great floor. <laughs> yeah. The Negrete family, would, they couldn't be sweet or nicer. They fed us. They took care of us. And we showed our kids. That was the way I was introduced to Chicago. Through the negative. So, you know. 
Do we have time for one more question? One more question? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Everybody has to follow their own path in life, but I was wondering if there are any general principles or guidelines in life that have served you well for youth and elders. Yeah. I mean, I, I, I said it flat out that the key to my existence has been that I disciplined myself to do the things I love to do when I didn't feel like doing them. Therefore, I became all that I could be, not better than anybody else. Be better than somebody else. It's everybody's doing their thing. You know, what ends up happening is that you end up finding inside of your craft, whatever that craft may be, you find yourself to the best of your ability as a human being, the best of your ability, and not even thinking about the outside. Just you. How how well can you do this? You know as well as I do, man. You you've gone to. If you get a car fixed and you go to a mechanic that really knows what they're doing, it's like a work of art, man. You just choo, 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 choo. Then they hand you your car. And you, know, you, you know, a doctor gets you and you know, helps you out. And work, 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 man. Passion. They're, they're passionate about their work. And, and all I can ever say is, man, just find the passion, the ganas, the desire. And, and understand that uh, you have to have patience, a lot of patience. You gotta, you gotta take your time, and you, you can't be afraid of spending ten years of hard, hard looking at yourself inside of this craft. And then maybe, maybe one day wake up and say, "Wow, man, I can do this. I know this." You know, it's taken me ten, twelve, fourteen years. I went, I started acting in 1964 at Stella Community College. I didn't get my first paycheck as a, in the theater until 1978 when I did Zoot Suit. And, and that was my very first paycheck. Yeah. That was my very first paycheck in the theater. And I'd been doing theater since 1964. Here we are in 1978, 14 years later, and I made $250 a week. That was my first paycheck. Yeah. You know, I mean, I couldn't even pay for the gas. Nothing. Well, I take that back. 1978, the gas was like. 35 cents a gallon. Yeah. <laughs> it's a good old days. <laughs> but now, basically, artists, people, I don't care if you're 70, 80, if you're my age, right now, if you have a passion that you've always wanted to do, just do it and die doing it. Yeah. You know, just don't, don't let it go, man. <laughs> Live inside of that world. And just become the best that you can be with the amount of time that you have. That's it. I that, spent a lot of time. Yeah. A lot of time. I mean, you know that, that, that they came out, because in 64, that whole idea of 10,000 hours wasn't out yet. People weren't considering that formula where you have to spend 10,000 hours doing something, and then you've really learned it. Okay. That was, I, I learned that. I heard about that when I was in my 30s. 16, 17 years old, I had never heard that, but I ended up doing that for so many hours, so many days, so many years, and and I did it with, I didn't think I would ever make any money doing this, ever, and it would, and it happened, and then all of a sudden, bingo, man, I did Zoot Suit, and I'm not kidding you, when Zoot Suit, as soon as I got off the stage the very first night of Zoot Suit, my life had changed. That performance riveted and completely brought tears of joy and oh, such pride to the Latino community, Chicanos especially. They just like people that saw that performance said, oh my God, I don't know what, I, and they would come back 20, 25 times paying 45, 50 bucks for a ticket yeah. to get in to see the, the play. And so for me, it, it's just a matter of understanding from that moment on, 1978 to today, I've never had to audition for a piece of work again. Yeah. <laughs> now they, they come to me and they say, would you, would you like to do this? <laughs> and then I turn to them and I say very calmly, very quietly, oh gosh, you know, I'm very expensive. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> And, and that's a great lesson in that, that, that 
Eddie came from community colleges. Yeah. I came from a community college. And what got me into this career was theater in a community college. That's so right. I, I compliment Morton to, to bring more theater here. I, our people need to, to do it. <laughs> because you may not be an actor, but you may end up being a producer. Yeah. You may be a director. It, uh, this skill will teach you so many different things about humanity and who you are and the celebration of who you are and celebration of your culture. So, uh, Dave, did you yeah, need one more going, question? Yeah. 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 How did you deal with racism in film during your early years, on set and on set from other actors? Uh, let's, let's do one thing. I'm glad you, this is the question. The question is, how did I deal with racism? Okay. We have to stop using the word racism as a cultural determinant, okay? Now, what does that mean? It's a lot of big words there just for a second. What does that mean? That means that there is no such thing as races. There's only one race, and that's the human race, period, okay? That word race is a unifying word. It unifies us under the understanding that we are all one human species, okay? The human race. There are African cultures, Latino cultures, Asian cultures, indigenous cultures, Caucasian cultures, but there's only one race. So when they say, you know, how do you deal with racism? When a bug, when a bug does not like you, that's racism. <laughs> Okay? When somebody doesn't like me because of the color of my skin or because of my last name or because of the way I dress or there's some discriminatory way that they want to get, it's, it, that's discrimination. That's, you know, that is not racism. Because there's only, like I said, we have to stop using that word race as a means of dividing us. We have to use that word as a way to unite us because as I was saying earlier, we have a chore when we leave here tonight. And one of those chores, I think, is going to be now whether or not you can take the word race and not use it as a cultural determinant. So instead of saying, you know, that was racism, use the word discrimination, you know. Use, use the, to unify us, use the word race. But to divide us, use, don't use that word. I, I got to tell you, so how did I deal with the discrimination, the prejudice that I felt when I was coming up in school and when I was in, in, in my art form? Oh, I'll never forget. I mean, when, when uh, you know, <laughs> I used to be uh, Eddie James almost. And uh, I went into a casting director at MGM, number one casting person in the lot at that time. And it's, it had to go about 1967. And he looked at me and said, this is Eddie Arnold. What kind of a name is he? Eddie Olmos. You know, you know, Eddie Starr or you know, Eddie, Eddie, you know, London or Eddie, Eddie, Eddie Olmos? You, know, you already got, you know, you're way behind. I said, oh my God. And I stood up and I mean I was really so hurt that he would think that my name was not worthy of being said. You know, that it would not bring the attention that I should be getting, you know. And, and, and I said, you know what? I said, and then I stood up and went, ah, you're right. Thank you. Ah, thank you so much. Oh, my God. I, I don't know how to thank you. You're right. And I turned away, and as I'm walking, the door. I said, from now on, I can see it now. It's Edward James Olmos. Thank you. <laughs> from that day to right now, no marquee has ever not put my entire name across the marquee. Ever. <laughs> that's, that's one thing about Eddie. Our 
Edward James Olmos. Is we can joke about that. We yeah. actually, uh, I'll, I'll, we'll joke uh, together going like, am I talking to Edward James Olmos or Eddie right now? And he, but he, it's the hats he has to put on. And, and, and I realize that. And in Hollywood, it's actually a pretty friendly place um, among us. It is a family. I think of Pepe Serna and Cheech Marin and all the people we know and we work with. There is, of course, discrimination. Yes, there is. And there's, but what it is, is I look at it and say, people are not able possibly to see our potential. And I constantly love proving people wrong in all this. Yeah, I, I do. And you have done that your entire career. And thank you so much.